everybody. Welcome to Good Novel Academy. I'm Cici and Harry. In our last episode, we talked about some general facts about genre, what genre is, and why it's important. Here's a recap. Readers have certain expectations for each genre. As a writer, you need to satisfy their expectations to keep your readers reading, aka play accordingly to the conventions. Plus, you'd better not cross too many genres, otherwise you will be swallowed by conventions. You may select one major genre for your story, and you stick to it. So for today's episode, we're going to talk about two romance subgenres in detail. If you find it hard to decide on your subgenre, hope this episode gives you some inspiration. As editors, we are frequently asked by questions like these: What genre sells the best? If I follow the conventions, will I be able to come up with a unique story? The answer to the first question is, as always, romance sells the best. That's why you find so many romance stories on our website. That's true. But we don't want your choice of genre to be influenced by this fact, and start writing romance right away. The question you should ask yourself is, what genre of stories do I love to read? As the old saying goes, if you want to write, write what you like. And the answer to the second question is a definite yes. We have prepared an excellent example for you, but we are going to reveal it later in our episode. Okay, Harry, you're playing a cliffhanger here. Yup. But before we jump to the question of how to write a unique and special genre story, let's figure out the conventions of the genre you like. First thing first, before you write in a certain genre, you need to be a master of the conventions of this genre. To know its conventions, you need a list of stories and see what they have in common. So, Harry, what's your list? If I am to make this list from top to bottom, it will be like *The Lord of Rings* by Tolkien, *The Will of Time* by Robert Jordan, and *The Song of Ice and Fire* by George R. R. Martin. Wow, this list is just so hairy, like living in a fantasy world. <laughs> okay, what would you say these stories have in common?、Mm, massive world building, epic-like narrative. And supernatural beings. This story, they actually belong to the genre epic fantasy or high fantasy. So this fantasy subgenre requires its story to take place in its own original, created and crafted world. I just can't resist this, you know, building an entirely different world. My dream is to become a writer who can actually write an epic fantasy. You will. You have a passion for this genre, and that's the prerequisite for writing a good story. <laughs> Thank you. And you are right. Passion is the most important thing. I'm definitely not fit for writing a romance. But if I force you to write a romance, it might not be a very good one.、Mm. It would be a piece of shit. Oops. <laughs> Anyways, what's on your list, Sissy? Well, my list would be Jane Eyre of Charlotte Brontë. Beautiful Buster by、uh, Christina Lauren, and yeah, Fifty Shades of Grey. Hmm, <laughs> these are completely different from mine. They are all romance stories. You are perfectly fit for writing a romance genre. And Renaio, hmm, really classic. I remember reading that story when I was a kid, and I felt this particular hatred for the male protagonist in that story. What is his name? Mr. Rochester, you mean? Yeah,、um, I hate this Rochester fellow. I remember him being so bossy and rude to Janelle. I still don't understand why she wants to be with him. Well, Mr. Rochester does appear unbenevolent and a little bit bossy to Jane at first, but this was before he gets to know who Jane really is. After they get to know each other, Mr. Rochester turns into a very tender and caring figure, and this reversal is exactly what most readers are craving for, and is the most exciting part in a CEO romance story. Wait, wait, wait! What did you say? Fill me up here. What is a CEO story? It's like the, does the genre has anything to do with a CEO? 
Well, of course, no one in this story is a CEO, but it has the conventions of a CEO romance. It's a subgenre of romance. Besides the general conventions of two people falling in love and overcoming obstacles together, it has some specific conventions of its own. Hmm, sounds interesting. Can you tell me more about this genre? Sure, you have come to the right person. I call myself a master of CEO romance. Wow! I read tons of stories under this subgenre and know all of its conventions. Okay, I'm all ears. All right. Um. So in general, stories in this subgenre usually focus on the romantic relationships between the two impossible lovers, and the obstacle that keeps them from getting together is often the social status gap, like Jin Ai and Mr. Rochester. On one hand, Mr. Rochester is a rich guy from the upper class. On the other hand, Jane is an orphan girl from the lowest social class. So their love has crossed class boundaries. Indeed, and that's why it seems impossible at first.、Mm-hmm. And that's also why they held prejudices against each other at first. The readers want to see this impossible thing coming true, and to see the two lovers changing their minds upon each other. Um, if that is the case, we can say the same pattern also apply to Fifty Shades of Grey, in which we have this Christian Grey, a young business magnate, and Anna Steely, a college graduate. Yes, and at first, Christian only wants to build a sexual relationship with Anna, <laughs> but in the end, he falls in love with Anna helplessly, and this is the plot reversal that audience are expecting. Okay, I see. So Romeo and Juliet is not a CEO romance, right? Because both of lovers are of the same social class. There's no difference between them.、Mm-hmm. That's right. What about Titanic? Rose is from the upper class, while Jack is the working class. Does this qualify the story as a CEO romance? Well, no. Because Rose is not a CEO. <laughs> I mean,、um, it's not only about her social identity, but more about the personalities. A CEO-like protagonist is usually bossy, arrogant, and sometimes controlling. Who, after falling in love with the female lead, changes into his opposite version. Okay, one more question: Is this CEO figure always a male? Not necessarily. For instance, Miranda Presley in *Devil Wears Prada* is a CEO-like character,、mm. but it's not really a romance story. It can be easily adapted to a love story with or、uh, without changing the gender of Miranda. Yeah, that could be interesting. <laughs> Anyways, the low-born protagonist in the story also has a convention to follow. She or he has to possess certain outstanding characteristics that could distinguish her or him from others and attract the CEO figure. The common cliche is, the girl is extraordinarily beautiful.、Mm, um, I'm not someone upholding political correctness, but I still find this cliche annoying. I mean, guys, it's 21st century. Girls has better thing to do than simply being beautiful. Let alone the standard of being beautiful has long been changed. I can't agree more. You see, instead of being pretty, she can also be very smart, brave, hardworking, or、uh, has a strong determination to reach her goals. Jane Eyre is a 19th century classic, and its character building is. Better than many, I would say, many CEO stories of our age. Right, I think Charlotte Bronte deliberately depicts Jane Eyre as a not so beautiful girl. It is more her own characteristics that attract Mr. Rochester and help her to cross the class boundary. For example, she got this strong mental will. Oh, I love Jane Eyre. I think it's partly because the character design is way beyond its time.、Mm, yeah, I agree. Well, it's only my personal opinion, but I think it's important to give the female a strong inner word, like being smart, independent, and motivated. Many CEO love stories like to depict a weak female lead who is innocent, indecisive, totally under the control of the male lead. Well. 
I have to say, as a reader, I find it hard to relate myself to such a girl. Yeah, I know what you mean. The old fashion has changed. Today's world no longer favors weak female leads. When we read about the princess being locked in a high tower, we expect her, on her own free will, to escape the tower, rather than passively wait for the prince to kiss her awake. When you read through the most popular CEO romance stories of our age, you should find they all have this strong female lead. That's true. But Cici,、um, if all the CEO romance stories have the same set of conventions, does that mean that writers can do is only mass-produce similar stories using the same formula? Well, this is the concern many writers have. How to make my story stand out from others in the same genre? Here comes our example we have mentioned at the beginning of our episode. It shows you how to play with genres. <laughs> yeah, set up and pay off. Exactly. Okay. Recently, I've been watching a Japanese TV series called、uh, "This Guy Is the Biggest Mistake in My Life." Just like most CEO stories, we have a good-looking CEO named Amagi, who falls in love with a rather ordinary contract worker named Sato. He gets attracted by the female lead in a bar and starts his courtship. He buys her flowers and treats her with delicate banquets. Ha! <laughs> Same kind of CEO cliche.、Um, what makes this one stand out from the vast sea of CEO romances? Good question. It's all about the character design. This very CEO is a masochist. <laughs> He instantly falls in love with Sato when Sato trips him up on purpose in the bar. And、uh, Maggie, the CEO, does everything to please Sato just to be her slave. Ah, spicy! I know, right? In this story, the external conflict might be a little bit cliche. However, through character design, the scriptwriter adds some special and intense, and well, you can say somehow kinky internal conflict. Which gives the cliche a tint of uniqueness. So、um, this is how you can manipulate your genre. The very conventions of the CEO romance are contradictory to the characters' personalities. Here is where the magic crash happens, and what surprises your readers. But still, to be honest, I'm not a fan of CEO stories. I'm fine with the strong female leads, but the arrogant bossy male still irritates me. Why? Because you're not a boss? No, I just don't like that kind of person. You know, who thinks himself highly above and can get everything he wants. Why do you girls like these stories? I mean, do you find this kind of bossy males charming, marriageable? Well,、um, only speaking for myself. I like to read this kind of story not because I want to marry like a CEO myself,、mm. but because I want to see a transformation in this arrogant、um, jerk. <laughs> a transformation. Well,、um, this guy may start doing something really annoying, but gradually you know that he is not born a jerk,、mm. and there is something good in him. Eventually, you find this guy、um, somehow. Adorable. So what attracts me is not the arrogant rich fellow, but the idea that everyone deserves to love and to be loved. Ah, I understand now.、Mm, this reversing trope sounds very familiar, though. Like、um, teen fictions, they often have this bad boy character, right? Yes, and also mafia stories. Ah, mafia romance. That's also a popular subgenre. Yes, and we have lots of mafia stories on our website, but I'm not a fan of it. Why is that?、Mm, well, they are usually too intense for me.、Mm. <laughs> I prefer light and sweet romance stories, a dose of sugar and spice, and everything nice. Wow, I know.、Uh, it's like、um, before sunrise, right? I, I have read very、yeah. few of this kind of stories. <laughs> yeah, before sunrise, that's my dish. Well, mafia romance is everything but sweet and heart lightening. Yeah, they are usually dark, right? Gunfights, bloodshed, conspiracies, and killings, kidnappings, drug dealings, and badass boys. <laughs>、yeah.
and that part I do enjoy.、Mm-hmm. Anyways, mafia romance usually tells a love story that is not particularly happy and includes lots of dark elements. This is because it belongs to the dark romance subgenre. Wow, dark romance! The name already sounds badass. What are its conventions? Well, a dark romance must involve protagonists with questionable moralities. Think of a vampire or、uh, maybe a demon. So many paranormal stories also belong to the dark romance genre, right? Right. If the vampire or a werewolf enjoys killing or some other dark stuff,、mm. but this guy cannot be extremely evil. He must have something good in mind. Maybe、um, he is forced to do bad things, or、um, he is pushed by instincts. Whatever reason,、um, this guy must have a lover who understands him and brings salvation to him with love. That's the romance part. Ha! <laughs> I understand. So mafia romance follows these conventions. It's just not of a paranormal setting. The bad ass boy is now a mobster, but all the dark taboo elements remain. Yes, and it adds some other conventions. For example, a mafia story usually includes old mafia families, like the Corleone family、mm. in The Godfather, following an old set of traditions and patterns. And the families are usually Italian or Russian, right? A sapling is dressed as a gift. Alamayo, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But I guess it's a stereotype. There are also some、um, stereotypical character designs. For example, a possessive, dominating male saying tough talks like, "I will kill you if you want to run away," <laughs> or、um, "No one touches what is mine." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah, and a somehow submissive female, like innocent, kind-hearted, like the exact opposite of the male protagonist. Right, and there must be a huge contrast between the lovers, the bright and the dark. The evil and the angel, and the filthy and the innocent. This contrast is the most important convention of the mafia subgenre. Ah, yeah, that actually explains something. I once read a mafia story in which the writer breaks the convention and depicts the female lead as strong and brutal as the male. The story is actually right good with. Intriguing plots on how the protagonists join hands to destroy a rival mafia. I kind of like that one, but it didn't sell well. I guess it's because it violates the, its central convention. Yes, I think it failed to satisfy the readers' expectations. Readers expect to see protagonists on polar ends. They want to see the theme: even a bloodthirsty evil can be saved by true love. A mafia romance violating this convention may still be a good story, but hard to become a popular one.、Mm, but there's nothing wrong with trying something new. I enjoy reading style stories reversing male and female roles. For example, the romance between a female mafia leader and her bodyguard. Wow, that sounds interesting already. Okay, I think we have covered a lot for today's episode. CEO romance and mafia romance, two of the most popular romance subgenres of our age. Hope this episode is helpful, my dear romantic good novelists. Yes, and in our next episode, we'll be talking about inciting events,、mm. the very first event that introduces the readers into the world you create. But before that, it's, it's homework, homework time. time. <laughs> so、um, last week we only received like eight assignments, and we really want to get more responses from you guys. So the same homework holds. What's your favorite genre, and what are its conventions? You can use some specific examples to support yourself. And if you run short on time, we have an alternative option for you. You can list your favorite stories in your selected genre, just like we did in this episode. And this is all for today. See you next time, and may the muse be with you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 들속에서네샴푸향만보이는거야스쳐